Okay, here's the thing. Everyone on YouTube suddenly does the 1980s references and pseudo-VHS analog aesthetic, hearkening back to a simpler time and the birth of popular culture as most Gen Xers know it. Well, it's time to move on. It's time to try something different. No more living in the past. No more callbacks to a bygone and best forgotten era. Let's look forward. What? It does seem odd that with all the 1980s nostalgia being recycled over the past 20 years, so few people recognize the biggest show from the 1980s. Yes, you know that JR got shot, but I'm willing to bet very few of you know who shot him and why. Dallas holds a special place in my heart. It's one of my very first primetime TV memories from time spent with my grandparents. That, and when Reagan got shot. That was less fun. Apparently, I wasn't alone in that at the time. Dallas is widely credited with reviving the primetime soap opera after nearly a decade of decline. It was so popular that it spawned scores of imitators including Dynasty, Falcon Crest, and the Colbys, and even its own spin-off, Knott's Landing. By the time the original series wrapped in 1991, it had dominated the 80s drama landscape. A sequel series ran from 2012 to 2014, but it never really recaptured the magic of the original. The series was originally conceived as a fish-out-of-water tale, with Victoria Principal and Patrick Duffy as newlyweds struggling to make a go of it with Duffy's insular, conservative family providing the obstacles. Over time, though, Larry Hagman's J.R. Ewing started to take center stage, and the show became more about his amoral business dealings than soapy romance. But in the beginning, there was Digger's daughter. The story follows Pamela and Bobby Ewing. Newlyweds who are just so ridiculously in love with one another that they barely care about the rivalry between their two families. It seems Bobby's father, Jock Ewing, swindled Pamela's father out of an oil fortune back in the 1940s, and Pam's father has been an alcoholic ever since. And not the fun kind, the... the sad kind. We could have a <laughs> I, said, I said, that's plenty. He looked at me and laughed in my face and said that... I own nothing, nothing at all. Pamela's brother Cliff has dedicated his life to bringing down the Ewings. And since he's a lawyer working for the state senate's land use committee, he has the power to do just that. Jock and JR's heartburn is compounded when they find out who Bobby has married. JR wants to know if she's anybody. She is no one. She is everyone. She is. Pamela. JR outright accuses her of being a spy, and Jock pumps her for information. When's that brother of yours going to give up that crusade against us Ewings? Daddy, I don't think this is a proper time to discuss it. I don't know why not. We don't talk business at this hour, Chalk. I just love this moment. For all his star-spangled, belt-buckled, don't-mess-with-Texas bravado, Jock Ewing sure as f*** knows not to mess with Miss Ellie. She swatted him like Dikembe Mutombo. The ranch hand, Ray Krebs, is crestfallen over Pamela's marriage, as he used to date her back in the day. By the way, when we first meet Ray, he's screwing around with the youngest Ewing, Lucy, the daughter of the family's black sheep, Gary. Lucy, at this point, is 16 years old. Ray, have a seat. What are you doing here today? Well, I'm, I'm here because I was slightly concerned. Concerned about what? Well, concerned because she's talking to people that are a lot younger, a lot older on the website. No one. This relationship would get icky for other reasons later in the series, but for now, let's just all agree that this is gross and move on with our lives. 
do it. Call me her name. Do you think he was up to more than just sharing a joint? The Barnes family isn't exactly kosher with the whole thing either. Cliff accuses Pamela of sleeping with the enemy, and Digger nearly disowns her. Pamela stands up to them though because that's the kind of strong second wave female character she is. Speaking of the opposite of feminist, JR's wife Sue Ellen, the former Miss Texas, immediately ices Pam out because... How do I put this? She's horrible. She's a horrible, horrible human being. Her personality is made out of pure concentrated coronavirus. Her smile would frighten small children if she hadn't eaten them already. Sue Ellen once joined a satanic cult and the devil just responded, Yo, game recognizes game. But she eventually got better. We call that a character arc. No one is as salty about the whole thing as JR though. He hatches a scheme to drive a wedge between Pam and Bobby using Ray Krebs. Ray, who is a bit of an aw shucks dunce in these early episodes, agrees to go along with it because, well, aw shucks, why not? Still for this. I don't want to stand still for it either, JR, but they're married, ain't they? Yeah. So were those fine ladies we spent that memorable weekend with up at Waco last year. <laughs> <laughs> we are horrible people. Ray takes Pam out in the helicopter to tour the Ewing home of South Fork. When they set down outside of Ray's house, he shoves them both in the lake for funsies. Maybe it's not too late. Oh, I don't know. How could you not know? You're already married. I wouldn't have had to do this. Aw, <laughs> oh, shucks. Of course, that's when JR and Bobby return to find Ray and Pam drying their clothes. The plot backfires, though, as Pam just explained what happened and Bobby believes her. Yeah, Yago JR ain't in these first episodes. JR's schemes would get more complex and effective in later seasons. As it is, this one nearly earns him a punch in the nose. At the end of the episode, all is well with the new couple, and Jock warns JR that if he and Sue Ellen don't hurry up, Pam and Bobby will give Jock his first male heir to the Ewing fortune. See your wife, Junior. If they get too much of a head start, my first grandson's gonna be theirs. Night. Because you know, Shakespeare and shit. As first episodes go, this one does what it set out to do. We get to know all the Ewings and their relationships to one another. We find out who hates who. We get the premise of the show: young lovers torn between love and family loyalty. The pace of the episode is positively breezy for its content. There's always something happening, and the scenes never play longer than they need to. We have a lot of characters to meet, after all. What we don't get is consistent acting. Patrick Duffy is fine as Bobby, the earnest playboy turned honest man. And longtime actress Barbara Bel Geddes adds a much needed bit of warmth as the family's matriarch, Miss Ellie. The real standout, of course, is Hagman, the literal embodiment of House Slytherin. The man is so Machiavellian, Pete Buttigieg thinks that he should be less calculating. The great thing about JR is that his evil is rooted in unrecognizably human desire. He wants his father's love and affection. Prepping, that's what it is. Everything JR does is I to earn his cold, traditional father's down. recognition and live up to his example. This is just great characterization. Are you putting me in your chair, Daddy? Sure, that's fine. Just keep it that way. But I got more than one son. And nobody says that you've got to run things alone. Who doesn't get great characterization? Basically everybody else. Victoria Principal is very pretty as Pamela. She's just so very pretty. Very nice and pretty. Ken Kerchival doesn't quite get enough screen time as Cliff Barnes to get a read on him in the premiere, but that eventually does change and he becomes one of the series' most compelling characters. Linda Gray, Steve Connolly, and Jim Davis are okay, but their characters are pretty one-note throughout the episode. The real weak link as far as acting goes is Charlene Tilton, who is probably supposed to be playing the character of Lucy as Lolita from the Nabokov novel, but she comes across more like a guest star on Hannah Montana. And not one of the good ones either. Like Mean Girl number two or something. You ain't got a chance. What do you mean? Well, when they don't want somebody, that somebody ain't got a chance. 
Thankfully, the character is written with a lot of on-the-nose dialogue, so we don't need a nuanced performance to recognize that she's supposed to be a spoiled brat who enjoys pulling the wings off of flies. Did you ever hear the story on how I come to be here? No. My daddy, he's the third brother in the middle. Gary, I heard about him. Yeah, the black sheep. A drunk. Like your daddy. Anyways, once upon a time, he went off and got this lovely 15-year-old girl pregnant. My mommy. He brought her home. If you're a fan of soapy melodramas already, you might be wondering what all the fuss is about. Most of this stuff is comparatively tame, and the values of the Ewings, while compelling in the more conservative late 70s and early 80s, haven't aged well. And I don't mean haven't aged well as in they're not politically correct. I mean, it may be hard for a modern watcher to understand why the characters are acting the way they do, or why they care about the things they care about. At times this is almost like watching a foreign film, because the values of a rich, semi-aristocratic family in Texas are just that inaccessible. If you appreciate a slow burn, though, and recognize that the first episode is really just setting up all the pieces on the board, you might like where this is going. <laughs> 